want to choose my words carefully, it would be a grave assault in our democracy. As much as Andrew Coyne is into politics, he actually has a, quite a bit of dislike for it as well. He calls it a sleazy, awful business full of desperate, unpleasant people. But he also believes that it doesn't have to be that way that we actually can demand better, so we get more than just party rhetoric and spin. So that's what Andrew tries to do. Newspaper columnist and as a commentator on the Nationals at Issue panel. With Andrew, it's not about siding with one party over another. It's about good government, policy, and accountability. It has to be accountable for the money it's spent. Funny thing is, though, is Andrew never really set out to cover politics. He thought he'd be an actor, even had a few paid jobs. And your wife? She told me she spent the weekend with another man. But public engagement is in his blood. His dad? James was the second governor of the Bank of Canada and famously got into a showdown with the Diefenbaker government over the economy. It actually became such a big deal, the government even tried to have Coyne Sr. fired. Well, like his dad, Andrew isn't afraid to stand his ground, whether it's on Twitter or in print. He's written for the Financial Post, the Globe and Mail, and McLean's, where he was a national editor, and now at the National Post, where he's in his second go-around as a political columnist. Please welcome back to the show our friend Andrew Coyne. Good to see you. Nice to see you. How's things? Things is good. Things is good. Busy. Lots of stuff going on. You must be. Yeah, the, the government's providing us with lots of grist. Does a writer at this point, a columnist, need their own voice? And the reason I ask this is because the left think you're right and the right think you've lost the plot. <laughs> so, where are you in that now? Uh, people are always going to pigeonhole. You know, as you say, it always depends upon where they're coming from, I find, for the most part. The only thing you can do is not try to pigeonhole yourself. So on some issues, I suppose, I'm going to line up with the right. On some issues, I'm going to line up with the left. As long as you're being true to what you actually believe, then that's all you can really do. But the debate in this country has gone to a point where the... It used to be the politicians would take their sides, and then the people would generally kind of float in the middle and sway here and sway there. But these days, people have become so defined by themselves and their, and their partisanship. Yeah, it's the, the partisan mind. You see a lot of it, of course, on, on Twitter and online. Uh, people like to belong to a team. They like to have a tribe that they belong to. Because, among other things, it relieves you of the obligation to actually think about what you think about it. You can just say, well, what does my team think about this? And right. away you go. Um, I find politics itself, though, at the partisan level, I know people talk about it being more polarized, et cetera, but I think if you look back 10 years, conservatives were way more conservative then. The NDP was way more left then. Uh, I think they've actually both kind of have moved a certain degree towards the middle, both parties have, and of course that leaves a lot less room for the Liberals. Right, and 10 years ago, the fact that you had, had that, made that statement and not even include the Liberals in the top well, was they, so interesting. They were occupying right. the broad middle at that time, and the broad middle is a lot narrower now. Can they then reinvent themselves in your mind? They can. It's, it's, it's really a 50-50 chance at this point. They, you could see a plausible scenario where they just can't figure out how to, where, where to go and just go off a cliff. Or if they're prepared to be bold and prepared to realize they've got nothing to lose, right. I think they can still have a chance. But, you know, the best analogy I can find is it's a bit like a hockey team, you know, that's won several Stanley Cups in a row. But that last one, they're winning it with 42-year-old veterans. Right. Does this sound familiar? And uh, <laughs> That's and a long you, wilderness for the Maple Leafs. And then you've got to go in the basement for a while. Right. And you've got to husband your draft picks, and you've got to take some time. And if you don't, if you're always thinking about that next Stanley Cup, you're going to spend a lot of time in the wilderness, like the Leafs, right. if you're prepared to take the long view. So to bring my analogy back to earth, if the liberals are prepared to take the long view of building a, 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 a group of voters who really strongly identify with it because they're their party, because they stand for something important, then they got a shot. If it's just about, can we get back into power next election, can we, can we get a really attractive leader, right. I think they're, they're in trouble. It seems to be, it only appears to be this case, that there's far more hostility now, certainly towards the prime minister, and even the... The, this particular Harper government's position towards the opposition. There's a hus that's how it appears. Is that accurate? It is accurate. I mean, this government, uh, um, as many people have said, it still has very much an opposition mentality. They still, I think part of it is the, a feeling that, well, everything's kind of stacked against us. The bureaucracy's against us. The media's against us. You know, we're entitled, partly as a result of that, to kind of take shortcuts and to be really kind of chippy and, and, and nasty. Uh, but it's unfortunate, and it's, it doesn't seem to ever end, uh, and it's, it plays out not just in their attitude to the opposition, but as we're seeing now that they have a majority, they're still not really taking the public into their confidence. Uh, they, they, they bring in policies and they, we kind of find out about them two weeks later because somebody made a speech somewhere in Zurich or, or somebody, there was some offhand comment in a committee appearance. They don't do what governments used to do, which was, you know, issue a consultation paper, have hearings, 
see what people think about it and then proceed. I think because Stephen Harper is absolutely tactical. Like he actually looks at the sport of politics, I think, and the, the or he moneyballed it. I think he just basically moneyballed politics and has figured out we don't have to say this much and it won't matter. And it didn't matter because no one got the Stephen Harper that is the prime minister is not a surprise Stephen Harper. This is the Stephen Harper of the last 10 years. He's just a little bit more moderate on the surface. That's it? That's right. It's, I mean, it's incrementalism now, which they always said they were going to do before, and then they got kind of sidetracked by, as I say, running large deficits, which didn't seem to fit with most people's idea of a conservative government. Uh, so it is incrementalism now, and it's in incrementalism by stealth. It's, it's, it's as I say, you f they pack everything into this omnibus bill, for yeah. example. So you find out, after you get a lawyer to comb through it, you find on page 330, oh, by the way, we've just abolished this department or whatever. Yeah. Uh, so it's... Do you think omnibus bills in a weird way subvert democracy? Yes, no, no, not just a weird way, in a very direct way. If you're throwing 15 different bills in completely different subject areas, everything from immigration to, to, you know, fisheries to, you know, what have you, nothing to do with the budget, then you're not giving Parliament a chance to vote on them separately. And so you, we've no idea what parliamentarians think about each of those bills individually. They just were kind of had a gun to their head of vote up or down the whole thing. And you don't give the committees, the relevant committees with the relevant expertise, the chance to really examine this. And you're going to make mistakes. You're going to bring in bad bills that way. Let's go to a provincial level. Look at this, this footage here from the Quebec situation. So obviously what's going on with the student protests is swayed a couple of times. Jean Charest has got himself into a bit of trouble here. I mean, what do you, what do you make of this? Uh, I think obviously there's a cultural context here that fees have been frozen for many years in Quebec or were before recently. Uh, and there's an expectation that that would be the case perpetually, I suppose. Um, I don't support the cause. I think people ultimately should pay the cost of education, or at least a good chunk of it. I think there were appropriate things brought in this legislation to cover off people on low income, so nobody on low income is going to see a, a nickel more in fees. But I think he let it get away from him. He, he was strong when he should have been weak. He was weak when he should have been strong. Uh, and he allowed the student leaders to get, a, to get the kind of initiative on this. Uh, and now they're in a situation where uh, he can't back down because then you'd be kind of basically validating a lot of law breaking that's gone on in this, and that shouldn't be the way we decide things in a democracy. Although civil disobedience has its place in democracy. It does if you're prepared to pay the price, and I think if your cause is sufficiently just. I think just saying, I don't want to pay higher fees, I'm not sure it puts you in Gandhi territory. Well, you know, <laughs> l listen, I hear what you're saying, but we talk about how important education is, yeah. and we know that 1% here at a corporate tax break, right, 1% makes the difference of, of a really affordable education. And I, I'm, I, I'm marveling at how the rest of Canada is kind of wondering, you guys have no, you don't pay any education. We should be, or the rest of Canada should be pissed at their, like, why do we send kids out there with these massive student debts well, that they can't get away from? Yeah, but, and if you want to change the way that we provide student assistance, I'm all for that. So rather than, rather than loading them up with debt, where you have to pay it back regardless of whether you have a job, what your earnings are, make the, the, the repayment as a percentage of your income later in life. So you pay it back over your working life, you pay it back as a share of your earnings, so if you make a lot of money, you pay a lot. If you don't make a lot of money, you don't pay very much. So you don't have that terror of, oh my God, I have to make my debt payment and I don't even have a job. Change that, absolutely. But give everybody, rich or poor, a, a, a free ride on the tuition fees so that rich, because most of the people who go to university, sociologically, are, tend to be from upper income groups particularly from people whose family, whose parents went to university. Right. Now, you absolutely, for people who come from lower income, you absolutely want to make sure that that's not a barrier to them. But as I say, I think the better way is to target student aid at people on lower income, to provide, as I say, the, the income contingent way of repaying loans rather than just straight loans. There's reforms you can do on that, but ultimately the biggest beneficiary of a university education is the person who receives that education. People who have a university degree have lower rates of unemployment, have higher incomes, and as I say, tend to come from higher income families to begin with. I don't think we should be making the rest of the, of the taxpaying public, people who never went to university, who are earning lower incomes, subsidize to an even greater degree their education. Or not looking at it like it's subsidizing a free riding, but just investing in your future workforce. Absolutely. And giving everybody a fair shot. But it's a, it should be a co-investment. It should be an invest, the, the student should make an investment. And when I'm talking about this kind of repayment on the basis of, of a share of your income, that's like an investment as well. Because sure. it's ultimately it's a cash flow issue, right? It's, it's not the, the total cost of education that's the big barrier. It's that it all comes at a big lump right at the start of your working life. Right. Uh, so if you can get them over that hump, I do think over time people should pay some or all of their education. It's one of the things I like talk, one of the reasons I like talking to you is the fact that we can just kind of work, work through a different issue. What, what I've noticed in a lot of talk, you guys do a really good job of, job of this in the ad issue panel as well, which you don't see a lot of elsewhere, which is sports. Punditry has become like sports talk now. Mm -hmm. And when the debate becomes about the debate as opposed to what you're actually debating, I find that 
well, that's actually a problem. Yeah, and we do too much of that on the panel, frankly, is uh, too much of what's the politics of this rather than the substance. I think we get a better balance than most of the panels do. Uh, but, uh, yeah, there's too much of how will this play? How does this look? Yeah. How should the government be positioning itself? And, and rather than what's right and wrong in here. And certainly in, in a lot of the coverage that we do, it's... We, we become very enamored of the strategists because we're talking to them and we kind of want to be like them because they're very savvy. <laughs> and so you look at the political coverage and 80% of it is about strategy and tactics. Well, for most of the reading public, they don't really care. What they want to know, especially at election time, is who are these people yeah. and what are they going to do if they get into office? And we give them that about maybe 10% of the time. So we need to change the balance. One of the things that's also happened to this country for some reason, it's a little bit better than it used to be, but we do care an awful lot what other people think about it, certainly other heads of state. You know, when, they, when our name comes up, Canadians are still like, oh my God, they know we're here. They mentioned us. I interviewed a head of state who had some pretty strong words about Canada. I wanted to get your thoughts on this. What's your relationship like with Canada and our <laughs> Prime Minister, Stephen Harper? If there was ever an, uh, an argument against democracy, it is Stephen Harper. But I would say, uh, I commend your leaders on silencing your media. For the last 10 years, I have not even heard a single noteworthy event happening in Canada. <laughs> Tell me about Wadiya. The people in Wadiya, they are, they are very similar to you Canadians. Their greatest strength is sitting quietly and politely obeying without question. <laughs> was that accurate? Was that all improvised? Yeah, uh, that, a lot of that was improvised. Yeah, yeah. A lot of it wasn't because we were doing a character thing, but, but <laughs> a lot of, it was really hard to keep a straight face. Uh, I actually think we oversell the, you know, we're polite, we're diffident. You know, if you look back at our history, the people who really matter in our history, but all kinds of radicals and madmen. I mean, you know, Sir John A. Macdonald was a drunk. Uh, Amorta Cosmos, the founder of uh, BC, was a, a madman. So we do have a, 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 a Hellcat uh, a, a part of our, again, of our character and our history that I think has tended to get overwritten and, and underemphasized. Maybe there's a reason for that. We don't want to oversell that part of our culture. Maybe, exactly. Maybe. Stick around. More with that, Andrew Coyne. I want to get to answer Paul Jewett, and we'll be right back. As you can probably tell, we have a live studio audience. I'd love it if you would join us. Go to strombo.com slash tickets for more. Meet Boring Robin tonight with seven men in Blue Gale Road near a door. Meet seven boring blue robins tonight at Naughty Gale's door. <laughs> many don't know. Uh, many don't know that you were an actor. Uh, briefly. <laughs> that, that would be about half of my professional acting career. The other is I was in uh, Adam Agoyan's uh, first uh, feature film, Next of Kin. I yeah. played, I played uh, Man on Elevator. Man on Nice. <laughs> I, it's kind of the definitive performance, I if think. You, if you ever make an album, that's what it's got to be called. Man on Elevator. Man on Elevator. <laughs> Alan Doyle's was Boy on Bridge, your Man on Elevator. Uh, you, I mean, you have a family of, of, of public people and performers. I mean, that's a big part of your uh, life. My sister Susan is a wonderful actor and, and writer and uh, was one of the creative forces behind uh, uh, Slings and Arrows. Which is one of the best TV shows this country's ever produced. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, oh, so, speaking of your family. Your great, or your great grandfather fought during the Fenian raids. Your father fought a public battle against the Diefenbaker government. What's the big fight that you want to be remembered for? Uh, <laughs> I hope neither of those. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I think the great gift that you have in this job is you get to write what you think. You get to tell the truth as you see it. And I hope at the end of the career, people will say, you know, the guy basically said it, called it as he saw it. How do you do that, though? I mean, because you also have to be a bit of a provocateur. How do you do what you think and also... Well, you, you I that. think that what you're, in my view, what you should be trying to do, first of all, is, is your first duty is to be read. So you, if you're going to persuade people to spend three minutes reading your column, you better make it worth their while one way or another. Make yourself agreeable company. But also, you're trying to persuade people of something they didn't already believe. So I actually don't think you should just be going out there just to provoke people. You should be trying to get inside their heads and say, if I think that my point of view is a reasonable one and, and there are reasonable people who disagree with me, how do I make them see it my way? Who's your nemesis? Do you have one? Uh, I don't know if I have one that I know of. They're probably out there lurking. 
<laughs> have you ever replied to somebody on Twitter and then very quickly deleted it before you hit send? Uh, I have, and, and many times. Uh, <laughs> most of the time, it's not worth it. Uh, uh, most of the time, you just, just let it ride. I do find retweeting the most savage and nasty assaults uh, it seems to be the best way to calm That's them down. I do, and you just send to people who like you on everybody. Just look, they're looking for recognition. Yeah, I, I love it. I do it all the time. What are you most afraid of? Uh, um, being found out. That's, I mean, that's a very common yeah, response. I, mean, I, think, I think, you know, we, we all are, are, have sort of imposter syndrome or whatever, that, that, uh, that people will think that you're, you're, you know, I don't know, you're not true to yourself or whatever. Yeah. A lot of people in the public eye feel like they're a fraud in a, in, in, in a bizarre well, way. Well, I mean, the, the, my job is a fraud. Let's, let's be frank, right? I'm supposed to be this instant expert on every subject under the sun. Right. And, and so it is always a bit of a, of a high-wire act. You're trying to, without overselling what you know about it, you're trying to at least be one step ahead of your average reader. Uh, and so, yeah, there's always an element of, of, of fraud in that. Absolutely. You can check it out. So he's a columnist for Post Media National Post, and, of course, on the National, he's a regular on the Ad Issue panel right here on the Mother Corporation, Andrew Coyne. It's great to see you. Good to see you, man. <laughs> believe, then that's all you can really do. But the debate in this country has gone to a point where the... It used to be the politicians would take their sides, and then the people would generally kind of float in the middle and sway here and sway there. But these days, people have become so defined by themselves and their, and their partisanship. Yeah, it's the, the partisan mind. You see a lot of it, of course, on, on Twitter and online. Uh, people like to belong to a team. They like to have a tribe that they belong to. Because, among other things, it relieves you of the obligation to actually think about With Andrew, it's not about siding with one party over another. It's about good government, policy, and accountability. It has to be accountable for the money it's spent. Funny thing is, though, is Andrew never really set out to cover politics. He thought he'd be an actor, even had a few paid jobs. And your wife? She told me she spent the weekend with another man. But public engagement is in his blood. His dad, James, was the second governor of the Bank of Canada and famously got into a showdown with the Diefenbaker government over the economy. It actually became such a big deal. This is good. Busy. Lots of stuff going on. You must be. Yeah, it's like the government's providing us with lots of grist. Does a writer at this point, a columnist, need their own voice? And the reason I ask this is because the left think you're right and the right think you've lost the plot. So <laughs> where are you in that now? Uh, people are always going to pigeonhole. You know, as you say, it always depends upon where they're coming from, I find, for the most part. The only thing you can do is not try to pigeonhole yourself. So on some issues, I suppose I'm going to line up with the right. On some issues, I'm going to line up with the left. As long as you're being true to what you actually... The government even tried to have Coyne Sr. fired. Well, like his dad, Andrew isn't afraid to stand his ground, whether it's on Twitter or in print. He's written for the Financial Post, the Globe and Mail, and McLean's, where he was a national editor, and now at the National Post, where he's in his second go-around as a political columnist. Please welcome back to the show our friend Andrew Coyne. Good to see you. Nice to see you. How's things? Things is good. Things. I want to choose my words carefully. It would be a grave assault in our democracy. As much as Andrew Coyne is into politics, he actually has a, quite a bit of dislike for it as well. He calls it a sleazy, awful business full of desperate, unpleasant people. But he also believes that it doesn't have to be that way. That we actually can demand better, so we get more than just party rhetoric and spin. So that's what Andrew tries to do. Newspaper columnist and as a commentator on the Nationals at Issue panel. 